Hey everybody, Aaron Count with Sage Dynamics. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about 3D and context again. The last video I did, I showed you guys how your center of mass point of aim can change based on the way the target presents itself. Uh, people are three-dimensional. We're training to shoot people, not paper. Practicing to shoot people, not paper. So we want to factor in the realities of that. I got a lot of requests for uh, the bullet path. Guys want to know, okay, if I shoot a target that's presenting or a threat that's presenting from from uh, a, center, a traditional center mass presentation or a side oblique presentation, what is the bullet path going to be? Well, I'm going to show you in this video. However, as a disclaimer, I have to, uh, I really have to underscore the fact that these are best case scenario situations. Uh, just because a bullet can traverse directly straight from the point of impact and have a point of exit that's in line does not mean that's actually what's going to happen. There's a lot of things inside the human body physiologically that can change the path of the bullet. Uh, organs, bones, things of that nature can change how the bullet uh, acts once it enters the body. Your terminal ballistics can be affected by that. Another thing to factor in is when we're using a handgun versus a rifle, your trajectory through the body is going to be different. But we will take a look at best case scenario just because I had so many requests I figured I'd put a video out there so you guys can get an idea conceptually of how it works in three dimensions. Alright, so as a control we're going to take a look at our best case scenario first. Your traditional center mass shoot which is this target squared to you, not using cover, not bent over, not turned oblique, nothing like that. A literal straight up squared front presentation. Now again, this was our best case scenario, our squared threat. Um, high thoracic hit, straight pass through. One thing to keep in mind though, is especially in a shot in this area, the high thoracic cavity, you've got the heart, you've got the lungs, you've got the rib cage, you've got uh, some arteries in there, and then of course you have the spine, more or less midline of the body for those of us that uh, have everything in order. Best case scenario, will a bullet enter and exit through human threat? Yes and no. Uh, situation depends. Everything is going to be anecdotal because gunfights do not occur under scientific controls. Now uh, we're going to look at a kneeling position shot. Um, kneeling is great if you need increased stability for, uh, for increased accuracy for distance or if you need to change the angle of the shot. If my threat is in front of me and there's people in the distance or in the background and I'm worried about either missing and hitting one of them or the bullet going through my threat and possibly injuring one of them, I can go to a kneeling position so I angle the shot up. But that does change point of entry, point of potential exit. So let's take a look at that. All right, so on the kneeling, my, my point of impact, point of aim, point of impact was basically the same from my first shot. But as you can see, the actual bullet path, the exit is uh, considerably higher based on the angle. Now your distance to the threat, your proximity to the threat, is going to dictate how extreme that angle is. And if the bullet exits the body, you can see it exits higher than a traditional front on shot. That makes sense, right? Because the gun is angled up. Um, but this is something that some people don't appreciate when shooting two-dimensional targets, when they factor in changing the angle of the shot. Even with this angle, I would have to go, especially if there was a person standing behind my threat that I was worried about hitting and I didn't have any time to change my angle or anything like that. I literally, all I had time to do was go to a kneeling. This might not necessarily remove that person from the path of the bullet, so I would have to increase the severity of my angle in order to get the round to angle up higher and go into the roof versus into a potential crowd of people. Now in this shot, I aimed higher on the threat, which would increase the angle of the shot. The angle is more or less going to be the same. I was able to get a little lower, but as you can see, still have roughly the same exit path. The bullet is exiting, if it exits the body, it's going to be back of the neck. Um, and again, anecdotal information, but if you think about it, the angle is going to continue to increase more or less on that flight path. So if there's people a little further back, the bullet could potentially miss them. What does this mean? This is why I preach headshots when you can get them, especially in close pro pro proximities, because if I'd taken a headshot, the severity of the angle would immediately exit unless there was someone significantly taller than my threat. 
Um, and again, is the bullet going to exit the head? With a handgun, it's highly unlikely. But in the event that it does happen, one, the head is the off switch. And two, it definitely minimizes the chances of striking an innocent person. One, because of the bullet's trajectory exit path, if it follows the same path as entry, which is unlikely. But if it does, it increases the angle of the round. And two, the head already sits higher anyway, and it's a better uh, point of aim for a threat that's closer to you because it's a bigger target, you can get it, and it's going to turn the threat off. Distance equals time. The closer my threat is to me, the less time I have to react, so I want to turn him off as soon as I can. Okay. Now, to change the angle of the shot in close proximity, this is our ideal situation. Uh, I went for a high head hit. I was aiming for brain stem. I want to get center of the face, um, bottom lip to uh, basically the middle of the forehead, that area. Uh, pretty decent shot, but as you can see, entry to exit, potential trajectory is if the round exits the head, which is highly unlikely, but it can't happen, especially with a rifle. Um, this is the trajectory I want ideally if I've got uh, a backdrop that's not clear. On a range, we can always be sure our backdrop is clear. In real life, we can't. So we have options available to us to uh, minimize the chance of collateral damage, the chance of uh, injuring, a, in, injuring or killing uh, an innocent person. One of them is to change the angle of the shot, the other one is to change your angle on the threat, which we're about to go into. Now to put things in context, uh, I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate what happens if you don't change the angle of the shot. Now, had a high, really good thoracic cavity hit, but I had an innocent behind my threat. So as you can see, if the bullet exited the body, if it would have struck that person. Now it's pretty common sense they are behind him, right? But from my straight front presented angle, I might not have considered the fact that the angle would continue through a three-dimensional threat and hit this potential person. So changing the angle of the shot, be it your elevation, or as I'm going to demonstrate, moving, flanking the target, attempting to flank the target, changing the position of the shot definitely factors into uh, shooting in 3D. Now you guys know if you've been to a Sage Dynamics class or you've watched other videos, I promote offline movement. Uh, especially on the handgun when you draw, there's that dead space there where you can fill it with another activity such as moving left or moving right, moving laterally, uh, whatever you need to do. In this situation, I had to change the angle of my shot. And kneeling probably wouldn't have made sense as we've already looked at how it, it's really hard, especially at close distances, to get that angle extreme enough unless you go to the head. So what did I do? I just simply moved offline and I was able to hit my threat, but if the bullet exited the body, my innocent person would have been okay. Now, again, this is a training artificiality because there's no guarantees that when I draw my weapon, he's not gonna move, they're not gonna move. That's why uh, fire discipline is so important. Um, be prepared to not have the shot available to you even though you think, if okay, if I move left, I'll have the shot. You don't know what he's gonna do. You cannot predict your threat's action. So you have to be prepared that even if you try to clear as you move, he may move in a way which basically places him back in a line of fire or places this innocent person in a line of fire. So you have to be prepared to seek cover and wait for a better shot, disengage and roll back, or address the situation in a different way, change your angle, think outside the range as much as you can to get a clear shot. Now, in that situation, say I didn't have the ability to move left or right, I just went to a kneeling, I took the headshot because I was close enough, I was confident I could get it. In this situation, the round went in high forehead, higher than I would like it because there's always a chance on the curve of the forehead, especially with a handgun, that the round could just glance off. But if it did enter, top of the head, definitely would have cleared, as you can see, there's no bullet holes in my innocent target. Now, taking a look at our defense of a third party situation, say we come into a situation and we feel that we should get involved, we clearly identify the aggressor, we can clearly identify the victim, and we decide to protect human life. We might, uh, the only shot that can be available to us might be a flank shot, depending on how we approach the situation. Now in this situation, I took a, a high shoulder or high armpit shot, but as you can see, if the bullet is going to traverse the body, the, the, the path of the bullet, the ideal path of the bullet, is going to be directly through that traditional A zone or the high thoracic cavity, the center mass where most people traditionally aim. So while it's a more difficult shot, um, horizontally speaking, elevation obviously isn't affected, and the bullet is more or less going to traverse where we want it to go anyway. Now again, there's a lot of organs in there. We got heart, we got lungs, we got bone, we got rib cage, um, we got a lot of uh, strong muscle tissue. So is the bullet going to go all the way through? Probably not, but it is likely. Um, with handguns, it's less likely than it is with rifles. But in the event that it does exit the body, we have a pretty good idea of the path of the bullet, and we know 
from just from the chest from shooting the high shoulder or the armpit that's where that's the same area we want to put the bullet in even if the target is faced to us we want to put it here from the side it's basically the same point it's just from a different presentation of the threat now even in training in 3d you can get used to best case scenarios uh, because usually when i practice by myself i set my targets up when i have somebody out here i have them set my threats up so it's a little more realistic but in a oblique situation where you don't have a perfect side angle or a perfect front or back angle you can find yourself in a situation where you have to target a uh, you have to take on a threat and the angle is uh unorthodox in this situation um just from the presentation of the threat, my, my, uh, my entry point, my point of aim was not necessarily ideal, uh, the leading edge of the back. But as you can see from the exit, if the bullet was to traverse the entire body, my exit would be that thoracic cavity. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, that potentially would have been a heart hit. It would have definitely been a lung hit. It's definitely gonna, re it's definitely gonna cause him to rethink his career choices just on the, the trauma that the bullet is gonna cause, potentially, especially if it traverses all those organs and then exits the body. Now, uh, another thing to consider is if the target, the threat, has changed his elevation. Um, maybe he's on top of somebody attacking him. Maybe he's going for cover. Maybe he's crouching behind cover. Maybe he's, you know, crouched down for whatever reason. If you come upon a situation, especially in defense of a third party, where you have the belligerent, the threat, the, ident the guy you definitely know, he's the belligerent, and he's on top of an innocent person, he's attacking him, and you decide to intervene, Angle is really, really important uh, confronting that because of the proximity of the threat to the target or the, the threat to the innocent. They're literally right on top of each other. Now, in a situation, especially defense third party, um, and you see it in law enforcement, if you have a cover officer crouching down or something like that, uh, people are close together, proximity, uh, the angle, your threat's going to change, your presentation of the threat's going to change. In this situation, this would be like my threat is on top of or crouching over, hitting, stabbing, whatever, uh, the, the victim. So I had a pretty clear shot based on my angle. If I had gotten closer, such as this distance, I could potentially wound the innocent person if I engage him, but that wouldn't make sense. If I can run up here and get a headshot, I will, but I have to be very cognizant of the potential path of the bullet if it exits the body. So in this situation, I took a back shot and if the bullet was to exit the body, it would have been a really good high thoracic exit. Um, that would have been a really, really good wound path. Um, through this whole thing, I've been firing one round. Uh, it's actually been kind of difficult for me because I'm used to firing more than one round at a time. We want to shoot till we stop the threat. One round is unlikely to stop the threat, so I'm always prepared to fire more than one round, more than two rounds, more than three rounds, more than five rounds. Uh, I try to keep it as, in my own personal practice, I keep it as random as possible to make it more realistic. One of those training artificialities, shooting paper, um, unless you invest the time to make your targets hit reactive, like put balloons inside of them or something like that, you're not going to get those hit reactive targets. So you kind of got to use a little bit of imagination, but in this situation, pretty decent hit. Did not endanger the innocent person, hopefully. Now, can the path of the bullet change as it goes through the body? We already talked about that, it can't. Um, that's one of the factors. When we do talk about real life, we want to minimize the risk to innocence as much as we can, but since we're using a firearm, we can never totally remove it. Now, when we, when we train realistically, uh, all good instructors have students at some point shoot from their back. Um, my opinion is there's two categories of shooting positions. There's those we choose to be in, such as kneeling or prone or maybe fetal prone, urban prone, whatever you call it. And then there's positions we're forced into. Being on your back is most likely going to be a position you're forced into. So you don't really get to choose the presentation of the threat. Um, when I think about reality and context, when I think about the shooting from the back position, that's a threat on top of me or who has already knocked me down. Maybe he's still standing fully erect, but his goal is either to injure me from a standing position or he's going to come in on top of me with a knife or with his fists. Because if he has a gun, it probably wouldn't make much sense for him to actually physically mount you. But what's our bullet path, our ideal bullet path, our potential bullet path in a situation like that? Now on this drill with the, with the threat mounted me, I fired two rounds uh, to demonstrate uh, what I consider to be a range-based training scar. The first round I fired from a close retention to keep my elevation low because I know in some of the classes I've been through in the past, when we fired from our backs, we couldn't have an extreme angle on our muzzle based on the, the artificiality of range training. Realistically, if you have a berm that isn't high enough or if you don't have an impact area, on this range I do, I can shoot over the berm in one of these directions and it's fine. My first round would have been in low in the pelvic area and it would have exited probably through one of his ass cheeks. My second round, I brought the gun up realistically where I'd want to and I put the round high thoracic, which is traditionally where we'd shoot our threat if he was standing up 
And as far as the shot is concerned, you can't tell um, from the potential path of the bullet that it was fired on a threat that was bent over me like this because of where I actually put my, my point of aim. So if I shoot low pelvis, I might get decent hits, but they're not gonna be incapacitating hits. They could potentially be immobilizing hits. They could shatter that pelvic bone, but immobilization is not incapacitation. So even if you can't shoot live fire on a range in this extreme of an angle on a threat, it is something you wanna consider for your own personal practice when you think about being in this worst case scenario. You have a threat on top of you, you're able to defend yourself and get to your weapon if that's your goal, or if your goal is escape or what have you, I need to still aim where I want my bullets to go, even if the elevation has changed. When people do standing retention drills, a lot of times they fire for the pelvis because they can't angle their gun up. Realistically, that's bullshit. You need to be able to angle your weapon as high as the training environment will allow you, or you need to find a place where you can be as realistic as possible when it comes to the angle of the weapon. You need to find a range with a higher berm, or find a range that has an impact area where you can actually shoot over the berm uh, so you can practice these high angle shots. Now, uh, reality is different than training. Uh, we want to train to reality as much as we can, but there are training artificialities, especially on the square range, especially if your range doesn't allow this kind of shooting. Uh, but it's something you need to practice, even if it's only positional practice with dry fire or a cert pistol or something like that. Um, and again, these bullet paths are potential bullet paths. They're not going to happen. They can happen. With a rifle, obviously, the, the possibility of that bullet path increases. But like I said in the beginning, as my disclaimer, there are a lot of things inside the body that can potentially change the path of the bullet or keep the bullet from exiting the body. Ideally, we don't want the bullet to exit the body. We want it to penetrate as deep as it can to hit those vital critical organs and then stay in there. So we don't increase the chances of wounding potential innocent bystanders if the bullet exits the body. But we need to train and practice for the possibility that the bullet will exit the body and attempt to, to make every effort to clear our backdrop, uh, the, the backscatter or whatever you want to call it, behind our threat uh, to make sure we don't wound an innocent person. Um, we always want to train for reality. We want to make it as realistic as possible. So this is something you can include, um, again, anecdotal information, but you can include it in your own personal practice and personal training. I'm Aaron Cowan with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly. Move, 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 move! Are you still on your phone? <laughs>